actually now it is time. So welcome everyone to the 2023 Cradle International Symposium. This year, the topic being reorientating authentic assessment for an unknown future and it's been organized by Professor Rola Awaji. Um, and today we've had a wonderful session um, with scholars internationally and domestically discussing and challenging this idea of authentic assessment. And we are really pleased here to have hundreds of Zoom guests now join us for this open live session where we will be furthering troubling this idea of authentic assessment um, in the question of how can we strengthen relationships between authenticity, assessment, and future practice. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the lands upon which we are joining from, the lands of the Rwandri people of the Kula Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. As we gather for this meeting, physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place, and in doing so, recognize the various traditional lands on which we do our learning today. And I encourage those of us in the audience to share the lands upon which they are joining us from in the chat. For those of you that I haven't met, my name is Dr. Molly Dollinger, and I'm a senior lecturer here at Deakin University in our Learning Futures team, and I will be moderating the session today. So to kickstart this session, we are first going to have an introduction uh, to the topic by uh, Dr. Joanna Tai. Following that, we have four different uh, scholars here, each with a very unique perspective on authentic assessment, who will be spending five or so minutes giving us their provocations on the topic, and then we will open up for Q&A. So let me introduce Dr. Joanna Tai, a senior research fellow here at Cradle. Joanna's research interests include student perspectives on learning and assessment from university to the workplace, peer-assisted learning, feedback, assessment literacy, developing capacity for evaluative judgment, and research synthesis. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, Molly and I can hear the microphone is working. So um, good afternoon, everyone here in the room and online. My job is to briefly introduce uh, what we, the panel, will be uh, discussing this afternoon around how we might be able to strengthen relationships between authenticity, assessment, and future practice. Um, and this is to say that perhaps there might be a relationship between these things, but perhaps our panel members might suggest that there isn't a relationship between these things. Um, so at this point, we are holding things a little bit open. Authenticity and assessment um, seems to be something that is valued and a, a positive, a benefit for many people. Um, students certainly uh, seem to ask for it. Academics also believe it is important. Um, and of course, people in the workplace and industry would, would certainly um, say that what they are doing is authentic. And it promises perhaps a relationship between what we are thinking about that we ask learners to demonstrate uh, within higher education um, and all the things beyond their immediate learning environment, whether this be in work, in social life, in, in some other um, aspect um, of future practice that we haven't um, indeed already imagined. However, um, already today we've had some discussion about whether well, what exactly do we mean by authenticity? And then if we agree upon or even agree to disagree upon what authentic means, how might we judge authenticity against existing practices, against something in the future? What kind of evidence do we need to determine whether something is authentic? Um, and should we indeed be thinking about this in a binary, or should we be thinking about authenticity perhaps more upon a spectrum? So these are, these are questions and problems that we might have to think about when here in higher education, part of our purpose is to prepare learners um, to educate people for the future, for a society whose shape, um, size is continually evolving, what we value, what is important to us. So then what do we need to do? What kinds of work, roles, professional capabilities uh, might we be thinking about, needing, expecting to come across in the, this future world? 
How can we think about lifelong learning capabilities that learners might develop and how can we assess those things? What should the relationship be between society, industry, education, um, in a way that promotes different forms of authenticity? And whose version of authenticity really matters? Should um, we be thinking about it from a particular perspective more than any other? Um, and how do perceptions and recognising that individuals perceive things differently, which individuals should we prioritise? Students, practitioners, academics? So hopefully um, our subsequent four panellists will be able to um, elaborate a little bit on these questions. Um, and so I will now pass to Denise. Uh, Molly, are you you're doing introductions? Yes, yes, absolutely. So Professor Denise Jackson is the Director of Work Integrated Learning in the School of Business and Law at Edith Cowan University. Denise is focused on enhancing students' employability and career prospects through embedding meaningful work-based learning and industry and community engagement into the curriculum. Over to you. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Joan. Afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, so challenges of authentic assessment with industry involvement. So we know that the onus is very much on um, educators to develop learning and assessment that meets labour market needs. And we know that industry can be quite vocal um, whether if those needs aren't met and where the skill gaps might lie. Um, we also know that we can work collaboratively with industry and community partners to develop our graduates. Um, and that's some key examples are experiential learning and another one is Will. Um, and Will offers, uh, offers a great um, opportunity to um, co-design authentic practice and assessment. A couple of examples, which I'm sure we all know, but just as reminders. So we have, for example, transdisciplinary Will. It might be project-based Will, where you've got students working under the mentorship of industry partners um, to um, identify solutions and uh, around key challenges. It might be organization challenges, it might be greater challenges, climate change, sustainability, et cetera. And you know, assessment around that can be very much scaffolded. It could be project briefbacks, it could be identifying strategies um, from you know students working collaboratively, um, and that richness of students coming from different disciplines. Another example is our more traditional work-based will, um, such as internships. And we know with this, we can have good practice would be initial learning plans where students in partnership with industry and educators might identify their key learning goals, how they're going to achieve them, how they're going to evidence them and what their KPIs are. Um, and that's a, a very flexible form of assessment, which... Um, enables them to identify the future-oriented capabilities that they need to develop um, and in areas that perhaps they might be struggling in and that they need to improve on. Um, and all of those things can help a student develop a, an appealing um, employability narrative. So while we can see those benefits, there are some very real challenges around um, authentic assessment and will as an example of how we can develop um, future-oriented capabilities among our students. Um, one of them is the key differences between higher education and work. So we know that work is very um, fluid, it's very ambiguous, it's very outcomes-focused. There's a lot of um, autonomy in how you complete tasks and, um, and it allows for creativity. In higher education, sometimes it can be very structured very prescribed, we have rubrics and we have exemplars and we have some quite um, structured instructions for our students on how to do things. And one might argue that that could stifle creativity and curiosity, um, but also it can mean that it's quite confusing for students when they transition from higher education to work, whether that's will or whether it's on graduation. And they can struggle in the workplace as a result of that. Um, another um, challenge is the differences between theory and practice. Um, so students learn about different theories, obviously, in the classroom. They go to work. They expect things to be the same, and often they're not. And I know from conversations with our own students that they really grapple with those differences. They can't understand why they um, exist. And, you know, that that, that offers a, a real challenge for us when we're coming to develop our students and actually also um, assessing them. 
And I think it also poses a great opportunity for us. Um, when you have that difference, you have to think, why is there that difference? And maybe the fact that students can bring their theory into the workplace it might, and, and back again into the, the real practice, back into the classroom, collectively students with academics and industry partners might actually be able, to, be able to identify new ways of doing things and new capabilities that we need in order to be able to do those things. Um, other difficulties, transdisciplinary will we know is, is um, a very rich, um, fertile learning ground where you've got students with different perspectives from different disciplines. But we know that in higher education, there can be issues with having students from different subjects, with different learning outcomes, different assessments, different revenue streams, um, different semester cycles, all trying to coordinate them in one place can be hard. Um, another problem is the notion of failing. Um, we, we know that in, uh, students can fail and actually when they're going through that process of failing they learn from that process and why we might be encouraging them and reassuring them that that's okay what happens in industry when they're working with real data real clients um, in real time is failing okay do industry partners think that's okay that's I'm not saying either way I'm just throwing it out there that that's a challenge that we also face um, another one is confidentiality. When students are working in the workplace, we ask them to gather evidence of their learning, which can pose challenges in some organisations and some sectors. And another thing that can be problematic is often the quality of students' learning, doesn't matter how authentic the assessment task is, it's very much reliant on feedback from industry partners. And we need quality feedback for students to learn from that. Um, and we spend a great deal of time and will preparing our students for the experience, um, but not so much our workplace supervisors. Um, and they might not be you know, necessarily trained to give that feedback to students in a constructive and timely way, which can be problematic. Um, one other point is um, student assessment or sorry, assessment in will. Very much the feedback that we've had from our students is they want to see that close coupling of the work that they do in the workplace or in the practical setting and their assessment. And if there's a disparity between the two, they can find it frustrating. And some of that is because of workload. Why am I being asked to do different things? Um, but when you've got you know, a mass of students going out on placement, all doing different things, let's think about you know, business, IT, um, arts and humanities how do you um, how do you have that close coupling it can be difficult and one final challenge and there's lots of points around this which I won't go into because of time sorry um, is um, the differences between um, professionally oriented degrees which can be very prescribed they have competency standards everyone let's teach teacher education as an example students go into schools they know what they need to do and the people that are supervising them, i.e. the teacher, the teachers themselves have been through that process. Whereas you take um, degrees which aren't professionally accredited, don't have prescribed competency standards, can be quite a challenge for students and for academics when um, it's very grey, it's very bespoke and it really depends on the organisation that they're based in. It's very context dependent. So I guess the question there is, do we want to be identifying requisite capabilities in those professions, in those degree areas? Um, or is that restricting us? Is that bounding us? We're talking about future-oriented capabilities. Do we leave it open rather and let them emerge and let them evolve? Um, and also related to that is assessing those students in areas where there aren't prescribed competencies. Um, how do we have a how do we manage a situation where you've got a hundred different workplace supervisors supervising and grading um, and evaluating students from a hundred different fields within I'll take business because that's my area. How do we make sure that they're consistently evaluating and we we can fairly moderate those marks so they actually feed fairly into the students' grades? Mm -hmm. So just a few challenges there for us to think about and I'm sorry I didn't really touch on any solutions but just yeah hopefully up for discussion hopefully. thank you so much Denise and I think Denise you know what she was saying really points to sort of the overarching theme of the conference so far which is we all understand the utility and perhaps even mm -hmm. the value in the discussing of authentic assessment 
But when we um, take it just at face value and don't sort of pull it apart at the phrase and understand what it actually means in practice and, you know, all of the, the different perspectives and how you assure for quality and all of these other things, we realize that it is actually quite a complex area. So I do encourage those joining us online to continue to submit questions in the Q&A as we will have time for that afterwards. Any of Denise's questions that she posed would be great places to start. But we'll now move over to Associate Professor Kelly Matthews, um, who is an Associate Professor for Curriculum at the University of Queensland Institute for Teaching and Learning Innovation. Kelly researches student voice and student partnership in higher education. Her aim is impact, changes that make everyday learning experiences better for both students and teachers as well. Thank you so much, Molly. And thank you so much, Denise. It was really the expertise. I could just feel the expertise and the really understanding of the depth and the breadth around Will. Um, I want to start by first just um, paying my respect to any First Nations or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here with us today, particularly acknowledging um, the referendum outcome this weekend. And I kind of want to take it in a bit of a different direction, if that's okay with you. How would you describe your relationship with work? Just one word. You're welcome to put it into the chat in the room. Just how would you describe your relationship with work? Do you live to work or do you work to live? Hmm. Authentic. Authentic. <laughs> balanced? I love balance. I need to have a chat with you about balance. Fraught. Fraught. Exciting. Exciting. Yes. We've got flow, love it from the chat. Flow, love it. Bit of both. Bit of both. Work to live and live to work. So the idea is I want to I want to come to this idea that we're having a conversation about authentic assessment. And the, the question that we were posed with is to strengthen the links between assessment, authenticity, and future practice in an uncertain world, uncertain future. We could say it's uncertain now and into the future, but with the assumption that this is about work. And these are really important conversations that we need to be having in higher education about that relationship between higher education and the pathways to work and the pathways between work and higher education. And in the spirit of collective sense making and criticality and the possibility of being a bit provocative, I want to extend beyond that. What role does authentic assessment play into how students and learners see themselves now and into the future, not just with work, but also in how they can build a healthy relationship with work in the way that work is framed now in many conversations that we're having about authentic assessment and even higher education. And I'm gonna take a stance here. I'm gonna suggest that when it comes to authentic assessment, we need to keep water between assessment, authenticity and work. And what I mean by that is I'm okay for authentic assessment to be a bridge between, yes, I see a future within work and I wanna walk, walk across that. Yet there's gotta be other bridges that students and academics can think about walking across when we think about that connection between higher education society and what it means to be authentically assessed or assessed in a way that feels authentic to who I am now and maybe who I wanna be with what's happening in my discipline, in my domain, in my understanding of knowledge and who I am. And why I say I want to keep some distance, some water between, is because I do think there's a risk if we conflate and confound authentic assessment and just assume it's always about that work-ready graduate. It's always about making sure that we're getting that. Again, it should be part of the conversation, but should it be the same conversation? And is there space that we can be thinking about ways in which authentic assessment helps students, not just ontologically to see themselves into the future, but to say, who am I now? And how am I navigating this learning environment that I'm in? And what is the role of assessment and authentic assessment and how I see myself and how I think other people are seeing me? So that's the kind of space I, I want to kind of keep within that spirit. And if we zoom out, another question I regularly asking myself is, what's the future I actually want to live in? Now we could argue that higher education is not in the future making business and, and this and that. We can also think though that higher education is interrelated with societies, with nation states. It's a global kind of capacity and building within that context. So there is this relationship where the real world in higher education, just troubling that notion that we're not in the real world when we're in higher education. What does that mean between those kind of relationships and interconnections? 
and the sense around authenticity. I think to really have this conversation though, one of the things I've grappled with and I've really appreciated is how do we actually talk about the complexity we're in and the hyper complexity and the super complexity? And there's these competing knowledge demands. There's competing expertise. It's almost like the second you think you can grasp to something that you know, it's changing or we're learning more, we're knowing more. And so I do think to talk about authentic assessment, we've got to have some conceptual knowledge or ways of talking about the types of complexity that's more than just uncertainty. It's more that we can't know the future, but that everything seems to be challenged and challenging around us. And what is the role in assessment in trying to simplify that and to make that easier for students? Or what's the role in assessment in saying, how does assessment, authentic assessment or some authentic way, help students to be more comfortable with the discomfort, with the unsettling that when we're going into a place where we're not really gonna know. And so it's a, it's a different conversation and it's a broader conversation. And I'm gonna end by saying this, I would love to see in our research more assessment stories, the stories that can capture just the messiness where we're not necessarily looking for that one unit of analysis or this or that, but we're trying to just pull back and say, when this people talk about assessment, what are they saying? How is it making them feel? What's happening within that? So this notion of assessment stories, and I'm gonna end with this. When we think about authentic assessment, who is it designed for? Who is designing it? And if the answer to that question is that students aren't involved in that designing in those conversations, then I think we've got the opportunity there moving forward to say, how do we ensure in these assessment conversations that we are having students as one of the many people in that conversation? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. We'll now be moving to Professor Keith Wiley, who's the Director of Innovation and Engineering and IT Education at the University of Technology, Sydney. Keith's research interests include learning mechanisms associated with collaborative learning oriented assessment activities. He has developed many innovative assessment processes. Thank you, Molly. And thanks for that, Kelly. That was really challenging. You've got my um, brain off thinking about what you're saying and what I'm supposed to say. So. Um, good afternoon. So I've been asked to talk about bridging learning and work in assessment. But before we can bridge anything to assessment, we have to know what evidence of actual learning is. So we've got to think about what sort of evidence shows us that this is a work type function or is it something that they're going to be learned and using in work? How are we going to assess that and what does it look like? Once we've already decided what the evidence is, then we can think about the learning activities. Then we might design something that's going to actually have our students engage in those activities, you know, to actually get feedback on those activities, to respond to that feedback, and then respond to their assessment tasks. So I think it all starts with what evidence of learning is and what evidence of, if you want to call authenticness in industry is. And we've got to start there before we talk about what type of assessment tasks or activities we do. If we regard authenticity as undertaking activities that professionals do, this is difficult to achieve because the nature of professional work is constantly changing. And that makes it difficult for us to actually prepare students for a specific type of work, which a lot of them have that expectation. We are having longer careers, but the half-life of our discipline specific skills or specific skills is getting shorter. So we need to prepare students for practice we sort of prepare them for what I would call transitioning to practice rather than being ready for practice. Mm -hmm. However, if you look at professionals' work, it's a lot about competencies and abilities. And these are processes, not products. And quite often in the university environment, we assess products. We don't look as much on the process that it took to develop that product. So to bridge learning and work, we need to assess these processes used in practice and not just the products or artifacts resulting from professional activity at work. So we need to consider how professional practice differs from the university context. First of all, the social and technical aspects of work are intertwined, they can't be separated. So we need to teach and develop them in the same context. Quite often at university, again, they're taught separately or assessed differently. Secondly, the autonomy, consequences, motivations, and continuous feedback cycles through work and their demonstrated achievement at work are often missing in the university context, quite often because we don't have the time. 
we look on a semester by semester basis. In fact, university learning and assessment policies can quite often restrict autonomy and unintentionally inhibit learning and make it more difficult to achieve this. And for students to take responsibility, manage consequences and from exercising their judgment, which is a requirement for learning. So we need to start by developing learning and assessment, assessing the attributes that are common to all sorts of professional work. Now, these are what I call the literacies. Arguably, personal literacy could be the most important, but there's also information literacy, feedback literacy, digital literacy, it goes on. And they can be applied into any context of work. And the development and assessment of these literacies needs to be embedded in what we're doing. Like practice, it's embedded in practice, so we should be embedding in our learning and assessment tasks. They've got to be developed contextually, valued, and they've got to be viewed as part of the profession and not as an add-on. And if we separate them, that's how our students will see them. Students need autonomy to be adventurous. You know, we've got to be able to make mistakes, self-determine, you know, experience consequences. Mistakes compress learning. So assessment should value, not penalise students from making, managing and learning from mistakes. So I never said it shouldn't penalise them for making mistakes, but valuing learning from them and actually manage them is what we should be doing. And that's the process and not the product. This requires students to be given autonomy and the responsibility to find and present their own evidence of achievement. We've prescribed too much what learning looks like. And it's an individual thing. We say, this is, if you show us this, well, then you've achieved this. We need to give students to develop those skills the chance to develop that themselves. It makes it a bit harder for us as academics to mark. Perhaps we can't pass it off to our grad student, perhaps, you know, because we have to use more judgment. But that's where I think where we need to go. Professional work also involves managing complexity where single best solutions don't exist. And the outcome and the ability to assess where you've been successful is often only in retrospect when the project is complete. And this is very common in engineering in my background. And managing complexity develops what I would call experience. So we need our students to develop this experience. So they need to be able to manage complexity. They will quite often resist from doing this. But what it does suggest is we've got to be designing our assessment practices across a whole of the program. We can't expect to develop students by doing it in a single semester and doing it in this context. We should have a plan to reduce support increase autonomy and re increase the responsibility students have to contribute as they progress through their degree. In disciplines like mine, we need to look at more observation and interaction with the students' as assessment and less about marking a submission, particularly long ones. I'm not sure what value we get out of a 50-page report besides you spending two hours of your marking time reading it. So what type of assessments could we use? One of the simplest things to do is to integrate current events into your teaching and learning. And it's for students to apply what they're learning in your subject. What are your learning outcomes? Because I argue that if, we don't, if we're teaching our students something that doesn't give them a different perspective on the world, they haven't learned anything new. They're just confirming what they already knew. So if you get to apply what we're doing in our classes to current events, it gives it that rich context because the real event makes things visible that a simulation won't. You can see how other people have reacted. You can see consequences. You can compare how you might have approached it and what you're doing. So at the simplest form, having that built into your class is a good thing to do. At a next level you can have is translating. We can't always simulate, or if you can really simulate work, but we can look at the processes of the type of activities that people do at work and do it in a different context. Now you look at the profession, most practitioners have autonomy and responsibility for making decisions and dealing with consequences. So if we want to translate, I'd say we need to create learning and assessment activities where students have to be leaders, not the follower, have to decide what to do, manage issues, and count as and what counts as evidence and demonstrate this achievement. And that's up to them. Finally, the last thing you might do is move to the studio environment. Studios are very similar to project-based learning, but they focus on achieving capabilities and look at the process again and not the product. The process is seen as evidence of learning. Learning from failure is encouraged. An assessment focuses on students reflecting on that learning and demonstrating 
what action or what action they've taken from the feedback and the learning they received and how it's influenced their ultimate achievement in what they're trying to do. So in summing up, a good deal of our current assessment practices may need to be changed, modified, looked at, discussed if we're going to really prepare students for practice and have something that links learning and work. But the first step is decide what the evidence of that achievement looks like. Thank you so much, Keith. And I can tell from the way you spoke that you clearly have years of experience and many of the questions coming in are going to be asking for examples. So you can start thinking of some of those perhaps now. And we'll finally finish this with Professor Dave Bowd, of course, the co-creator or co-director of Cradle and Emeritus Professor at the University of Technology, Sydney and Professor of Work Integrated Learning at Middlesex University in the UK. David's work is used both by researchers and scholars committed to the development of teaching and learning, and he has changed the foundations of assessment practice through pioneering research and development. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Molly. Um, I'd like to pick up on some of the kind of issues that, that Keith was uh, introducing. And I want to put on a different hat from the one I normally do. Um, before I came to Deakin, I was at UTS, and uh, my position meant that I was primarily a workplace learning researcher. And when I talk about workplace learning, I don't mean the learning of students in workplaces. I mean the learning of what you might regard as normal people uh, who are not students in workplaces. And we did a number of projects. And I'd like to just reflect on some of the things that come out from that. And it challenges some of the assumptions that we make about the world of practice. And it challenges the assumption that it's all going to change because there are some things about the world of practice that aren't going to change. A whole lot of things to do with knowledge and skills and all sorts of things will change, but some things are stable. So one of the big projects, we had an ARC discovery on learning in organisations. And as you might expect, the things we came up with was that learning was primarily informal we also discovered that nobody talks about learning in work. When you talk about learning in work, they think about short courses or workshops or stuff like that. And 99% of all the learning that occurs in work is invisible. So learning isn't a part of the, the workplace discourse. Um, it's also undertaken with other people. Um, they're not individuals doing their own thing. They're working in teams and groups and you know, sort of configurations. And one of the big challenges is how to work out what it is that they're really focused on. Because often in universities, we give the students clean problems. Whereas in the world of work, you've got to work out, well, what is it that I'm really doing here? You know, what constitutes doing whatever it is well? And I think there's some interesting contrasts between the kind of things we observed and the kind of things that are commonplace in universities. And this provides some clues about some of the changes we might think about. And they're not just changes in assessment. They really have implications for the curriculum. So the first thing is the, the outcome of people's work is really theirs as an individual alone. One of the things we found in every organisation was they all had annual, annual reviews, performance reviews, that kind of thing. Um, we didn't realise this at first because when we tried to find out how people learned at work, nobody, and I mean nobody, in any of the four organisations, large, small, public, private, you name it, in variation, talked about this as a learning process. Um, they didn't. The learning went on somewhere else. So they're learning with and from each other. Another part of the learning is reading the context. So one of the things that we don't give students much practice in is reading the, the context, and that is what counts as important. Now, we have a simplified, you know, course context, which they learn to read. Um, but in the world of work, there may be a remit or specification for the kind of things that people are doing. But they need to be contextualised, unpacked, turned into tasks, reconfigured in such a way that you can meaningful get some leverage on them. Mm -hmm. And, of course, in universities, you think, well, this is all wasted time. But of course, that's an intrinsic part of work. Um, another um, dimension here is identifying 
who to approach in what ways. So people learn from each other. They don't necessarily learn just from their immediate work team, but they need to work out who is it legitimate to talk to, um, who is it prudent to approach. And one of the things that came out of some earlier work for one of my PhD students is the last person in the world you talk about with regard to your learning is your on your line supervisor. You don't talk, even though it's in their job description often, um, you don't talk to them about that because you want to be, manage your persona as a competent worker, you know, that deserves your, you know, income from this job. So people develop networks, they reach out. A part of what they do is they read the organisation, see what's going on and where it's happening. And one of the interesting phenomena we identified that is linked with this reading the context is what we what we called making up one's own job. So you think, well, you know, in productive industry, you go out and, you know, there's job description, that's what you do. But we found in every single organisation that we looked at, and subsequently we realised it's also in universities applying to ourselves, is that people wanted to shift and change and develop. And they didn't do that just by doing something different. They read the organisation, they reflected on where they wanted to go, what they wanted to do, and they worked out ways of shifting their position over time in such a way that it, the work became more satisfying, but it also became more satisfying for the employer. They became more useful and they were more satisfied. So this was a very important skill that we identified. The other thing that, that came up time and time again is that work is embodied in practices. So it's not about individual knowledge and skills. In any given kind of work, there are ways in which we do things around here. And one of the things you have to work out how to do is to operate within how we do things around here. So you've got to suss out how we do things around here. And nobody can tell you before you get there how we do things around here. You've got to work it out for yourself. But operating within the context of a practice rather than individual skills and knowledge is a big shift. I mentioned already working collaboratively with others. Um, and the other characteristic is, is, is people we don't choose typically. Um, increasingly, it's people at a distance. We're not all sitting around a table or you know, working in the same uh, workplace. They're all over the place. They might even be in different countries. And as Karina said in her keynote um, on Friday, um, learning is highly situated, highly contextualised. And one of the things that we need to take into account is that. And the final thing I want to draw from this is um, the realisation that workplaces are not places where people are there to learn. They're learning, they're there to do the work. And one of the challenges we face when our students go into a workplace and, you know, work integrated learning or whatever, is that the priority is always the work, the substantive things that go on there, not their learning. But the important thing about work is that there's always some external reference point. We have to do it to satisfy someone and we have to prepare ourselves and we have to work with others to meet these um, uh, external reference points. Might be within the organisation, might be with a client, whatever. One of the challenges this now produces for us in the university is that, of course, um, we recognise that students working together is a very important for prepare, process of preparing people for work. But we are totally and utterly incompetent at doing this, and we're incompetent at doing this for, for several reasons, one of which is that in the workplace, people learn to work with each other over time, right? And we very, very rarely give students enough time to know how to work with a team. Mm -hmm. um, we also um, give them tasks which are seen not to be real tasks, but which are real reference point. So can we have more assessment that has external reference points? Can we have activities in which there's an impact of what students do on the real world? And that's more akin to the world of practice. The work we do makes a difference in the world. It isn't just something we do to satisfy some examiner. So I think there are some of the 
challenges we've got. And it's an issue that, that how do we bring in the collaborative? How do we bring in the practice-centered nature of the world of work? Now, things are going to change over time. There are going to be new knowledge, new practices, new everything. But some of the things I've been talking about are pretty enduring characteristics. They're not going to change overnight. So it's all very well for us to say we've got to prepare students for an new future, which is absolutely true, 100% true. We also recognise that that absolute future is embedded in real places, in real organisations, and people working with each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. All right, we have uh, five questions in the chat. I'd like to encourage people to keep asking questions as well as upvoting. Um, the first question we have is from Simon Buckingham Shum, and I think this might be a, a Kelly or a Keith question potentially, which is who can recommend strong analysis or examples of the power and pitfalls of involving students in co-designing authentic assessment? Um, hi, Simon. Thanks for the question. I'm not sure if we've ever met before, so it's nice to, I'm shaking your hand virtually. <laughs> Look, I, I can give you one example from my practice, but I think there's something I want to say first, which is, um, first of all, if you ever have the chance to go to dinner and sit across from Margaret Behrman, I, you should do it. We had the best conversation last night. One of the things we talked about was in participatory forms of research, similar to, to co-design, in what Peter Goodyear might call deep participation in those types of environments, you have to accept a certain level of unpredictability. Things are not always gonna go the way that one might might hope or think. A lot of academics talk about this. It's like, can I let go of the control to like let this process unfold? Can I have that much participation? Now I'll give you an example. Um, oh, it's 2020, I had a new course. I had designed it and it was gonna be face-to-face. -face. And like so many of us, I had to do it online. I have never taught online before. I think I'm a pretty good teacher. I mean, there's some evidence to suggest that, but I felt very uncomfortable. This was not something that I knew about how to, how to do well. Um, so I worked with some students, one in the discipline, one from law, I'm totally outside of the discipline. And we went through and said, like, just tell me about your experiences right now of what it feels like and what's happening for your learning online. And they started to talk to me and then talking, okay, so I, I need to think about ways to have points of connection. I need to have some forms of interaction. Yes, but don't, don't make it that my Zoom camera has to be on. Okay, what else could it be? So through that process of talking about how can I think about the course and the assessment, they did not ever divorce the course and experience from the assessment. They kept coming back to, the first thing they did is say, well, what's your assessment going to be in your course? So here's what I'm thinking about. One aspect I was talking about, again, to be tangible, was concept map. Through the dialogue with the students, they said, what do you mean by concept? I'm like, come on, it's a concept map. You draw bubbles, you draw some lines, you know. So like, I don't think students are going to know what you mean by concept. And I was like, you know what? I think they are. I'm not going to really, like, don't worry about it. And then I worried, and I went and looked at some other courses they'd taken the year before. What's the assessment in that course? Concept map, boom, tick, don't need to worry about it. So Simon, what happens after this? And through this conversation, I'm listening to the students, we're talking about it. We kind of come up with what the assessment for the course could look like, um, how we could build in points of feedback that they could do online that was not assessed. They felt very strongly. How can students have chances to talk about what they're doing, not assess, but make it individual. So get lots of insights from them about what's gonna be working here. And sure enough though, still in my head, they struggled so much with the concept map. They're like, well, what do you mean by this concept? You know, because first of all, I'm teaching these big concepts, change in continuity, what stays the same, what doesn't. It's a big concept. It's messy. There's no easy definition. They read a bunch about it. It's like, well, I want you to tell me the relationship between change and continuity. Think about your own life experiences and your histories. And they're like, how do I do? What does it mean? I'm not sure I just quite grasp that, right? Now, if I had taken that student a little bit more seriously and not dismissed it, probably would have done a lot more work of understanding, even if students understood the concepts and how we were going. So that was a lesson to me. But Simon, I think in that, the idea there was deep participation because it was an ongoing, let's get comfortable working together. Let me hear what you have to say. Let me take it seriously. Let's think together about what it looks like. The students in that case came up with a series of reflective questions, like prompt questions. I should never say reflection. Prompt questions, right? So they read everything the students were going to read. And they said, here's, I think, what's going to really spark how students will see that as being relevant. But you don't want to debate question, Kelly, this is the law student, because students will all just argue with each other, but not really listen. Like we had deep 
thoughtful kind of conversations. Um, and Simon, I think everybody who's tried this work can share many examples of, of the pitfalls or the ways that it can't work. But I'm going to go back to my Margaret. Whenever you have deep participation in your research or in co-design in this, you've got to be open to the possibility that it's not going to go the way that you planned. I hope I answered that, Simon. Keith, do you want to add anything? I know I have stuff. It's, it's lost in the recesses of my mind. Thanks for a complex question, Simon. I'll talk to you when I get back to you. <laughs> Now, I think that one of the things that we need to do is, I agree, you've got to have this shared environment and space to do this. So most of that information and feedback and um, interaction with students then needs to be done in the workshop setting. I call it a workshop setting rather than a class setting because I'm trying to get away from, it's not a lecture. You know what I mean? So most of that other work needs to be done out of class. And that also needs to be participative. So students are seeing what other students are doing and what they're suggesting. So I, I've worked on the, the place where they can, construct their own learning in different groups might construct different learning and how they're going to demonstrate it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we, you put out there, these are the competencies or these are the type of things that might be, and it's up to them to come up with something to demonstrate that and getting them to share it with students. And if you are teaching a really big class and you can't get a workshop environment, I've also tried using two and a half minute elevator pitches recorded on video, which students post to Canvas to 30 other students which doesn't take them that long. In an hour, they can review all of them and then they can have a dialogue about that. So, but I think it's too, it, it, you could see it as being risky, but it's not actually, it's transformative. You know what I mean? Because if we don't give them that risk, if you don't take that risk, then they're not really ever going to take the responsibility of doing that. And if you don't give them the chance to argue with you, so to speak, and it's when a student has a really good debate with me about why this is good evidence of learning, I usually convince that it is. You know what I mean? Because they're actually bringing that nuance there and they're developing the language to do that as they're talking to you. Thank you so much. Um, I might skip around slightly only because we've heard a little bit now about involving students in authentic assessment. And the point of this panel is also to make sure we touch on industry as well. So I might instead jump around a little bit and ask one of the questions um, from Margaret Bierman around if one of the purposes of assessment is to discriminate, and that's a big if, she, she clarifies. How does the panel see that playing out in work integrated learning contexts or contexts where messiness of work comes into play? And if we can specifically touch on industry partners in assessing students in practical settings and even the absence of government or external body funding or support mechanisms as well. Um, we might start with Denise with this one. Thanks for that. Yeah, you might, I might have to get you to repeat the first part. Sorry. Um, how the purposes of assessment, if it is to discriminate, mm. then how does that play out in work integrated learning context and that messy space? Okay, if it's to discriminate. So that sounds quite negative. Um, differentiate. differentiate. Um, okay, so I suppose in terms of differentiating students in the workplace. I think the, the key to assessing students in the workplace is that it needs to be flexible and it needs to be driven by the student because I think it's very individual. So, and I think industry partners need to be respectful of that as well. Um, so what one student does in the workplace is gonna be very different to what another um, student does. They need to negotiate their learning outcomes and what they need to develop um, and see that all the way through the process in terms of their own learning and their own, their own learning outcomes. So I'm not really, it is a very differentiated experience. So I'm looking at you with the question marks. I'm, yeah. So I guess I'm asking, and it was a big if. Um, what I what I guess I'm getting at is, um, if we're being asked to uh, assess that students against a standard where everything is so flexible, mm. what do you think? How does that? How do you think that? Um, what are the multiple ways? Because I don't think there'll be a single answer that might play out in workplace contexts or in where the messiness of work comes into play. It's, you know, the age-old question. If Again, from clinical, to draw the clinical education example, you go see a patient, you, you're, you're not obstetrics round and everyone else gets to see a baby being born and for some reason on your shifts, no babies are born ever. Y you know, there's a... There's a yeah, the differential of experience and then how does that play out? Yeah, well, it, it's difficult because 
every placement is different, like you said. Um, and we had, for example, we're trying to, um, um, for example, trying to see in students that they understand about professional conduct and ethics in the workplace. Okay, so we had a big focus in one of our, it was in a, one of our programs around that. And we tried to, you know, we're grappling with this as academics because we're saying not every placement is the same. Students are going to have completely different exposure to ethical situations. They might be working, actually, they might be working at home largely or in a very, very small business. So there's an example of how things can look differently. And I think it's around the, the issue for us is where you've got a generalist will unit um, we have learning outcomes that they all have to achieve and tick off, and they need to be high level. So some classic ones would be application and discipline knowledge. Um, it would be understanding professional conduct in the workplace, developing and applying your general capabilities, um, and also being able to evidence your learning and um, curate an employability narrative through a portfolio. If you keep those outcomes high, then high level then and general but useful then it should be okay for all the students even if their placement is very different um, but where it gets um, harder is if you've got very prescribed um, workplaces so professionally oriented degrees teacher education allied health um, it is very prescribed it's quite standardized and you can pretty much predict what might happen to the student during their placement but it's all those other areas where it gets difficult. So I guess there you've got to keep it high level and cater for all different scenarios and keep it flexible. Would anyone else, I have a, a follow-up from that. Would anyone else like to go or I'll, I'll keep going. Chad Gladovich uh, asks about how authentic assessment in higher education can be better aligned to academic learning with the practical demands of the future professions. But going off of what Dave has said, should that be, the purpose of authentic assessment, or is it something around uh, more agentic roles as citizens moving us closer to a future that we all want to live in rather than the described profession? So I'll, maybe Joe, you have the microphone if you want to start. Yeah, um, I, I guess it's always the continuation of what um, the, the question that Denise responded to. Um, and I'm thinking actually particularly of a research project that Roller and I were on and we asked students about how they felt about their assessment and actually whether it was authentic or not. Um, and it was really interesting because even the, the students who were in teacher education still felt that there was a disjunct, you know, they had these professional standards and they were doing this professional work and um, it was all clear what they were meant to do, but then the assessment didn't really attend entirely to, to their experiences, even with sort of those high level outcomes and, um, and, and so what we came to in the end is about the active role. And I think it actually comes to what um, Keith was saying about autonomy and ha having the students um, take on more autonomy and responsibility in how they're thinking about their learning and development and actually acting as that person to coordinate between what the university perhaps requires, what the workplace affords, and to actually do some negotiation between the different parties to come up with something that works for, for them as individuals in, in distinctive situations. Um, and so I think to, to link on to what Chad's question was around how does this work for the future professionals, it is ultimately about ensuring that students can chart their own path into the future, whatever that might be. It's probably not exactly what we think it should be, and it's probably not exactly what um, workplace um, supervisors might think is in the future because things just change rapidly. I mean, look what's happened with Gen AI. Um, we're all thinking about things differently now, but we still can't quite predict what's going to happen. Um, so it is, I think, in the end, a student autonomy kind of question. We have a question in the room now. Yeah, hi, um, Kate Lafferty from La Trobe. Um, really interesting discussion. I'm ECR. I've come from the AERC now at Uni Melbourne and just started at La Trobe this year. But I did spend over 20 years teaching in schools. So with my school teacher hat on, which is firmly my identity, um, I can't help but think of all of the problems and all of the work that's done in schools with students in building agency and building autonomy that then 
sorry, is completely undone <laughs> once they get to um, tertiary. And speaking from a school of education, the practices we're using aren't best practices. So my question really revolves around this student agency and the you know, building in risk-taking and all these things that we want to see in workplaces, yet every assessment seems to work in contradiction and in tension with that. So students are so focused on what do I need to get this particular mark, even with really well-designed rubrics, if I may say so myself, but um, even with well-designed rubrics that aren't that prescriptive, that do talk to the competencies, that do unpack the construct, that do reflect a learning progression, all of this stuff, and they're still paralysed by what do I need to do in order to get this mark. Comments? Yeah, I, th I think this is a very, very real problem everywhere. It's not, <laughs> it's not a teacher ed problem. Um, we, we have this very strange idea in higher education that students come to us, they select to choose a particular course and they enrol in that course. And then we seem to assume thereafter that they should have no agency whatsoever in the learning outcomes, the way in which they do things, the way in which they're assessed, the criteria, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of infantilise them through the ways in which we treat them. And it strikes me, and, and one of our PhD students is working on this, uh, uh, Darcy is working on this, that students have their own goals. They come here for a reason, right? They, they, they have their own desires. Mm -hmm. They have their own expectations. And we systematically suppress those. We say, well, they're not legitimate. They don't fit within our learning goals. So maybe we need to be thinking about creating more space in the ways in which we do construct learning outcomes, in which we do construct assessment, so that students can actually put themselves in there. They can actually rework and re-identify some of those learning outcomes to make them their own and to do things that enable them to become the kind of person they came here to be. Now, sorry. In adding to that, I think there's, there's also the thing you notice, a lot of people are worried about students collaborating. I know it seems strange because they call it collusion. You know, they're going to help each other do their assessment or that competitive nature. So when you can, you can change the focus on the achievement and then they're developing. What's wrong with everyone getting a HD if they deserve it? You know, what's wrong with everyone failing? You know, we have this thing about measuring and putting that in. And until we get rid of that, we're always limited that in some taste. And the other reason that we get is that I think that a lot of things that inhibit that is if we give more students agency and more choice and let them help design their tasks, a lot of people see it as more work for the academic. How am I going to manage this? So that needs rethinking about what you're doing in your class and how you're delivering your class. And as I said before, one of the things I think is that our class time should be used for that, or interaction time, if you want, workshop, for that type of assessment. I mean, lectures have gone out of most university years ago, but I don't think we still use all those so-called tutorial times. I've sat in tutorials and still seen, you know, the problem's going up, students sit down and get back up. We need to be using that time for that type of activity. And that makes it more manageable. And then students, it becomes, as I said in what I said before, we need these things to be integrated so they're seen as part of professional work, part of the practice and not something that's done separately because that's the way work tends to operate. I'm just conscious that we have some questions online and in the room. So we might go online, but then we'll go in the room next. So Zandra Zevitz um, is asking if you, anyone has any suggestions on how to design future practice of authentic assessments without primarily replicating previous, current, and often unwanted practices. And that's something we discussed a lot today previously with this idea that authenticity has been idealized and what is it that we're mirroring and do we want to mirror this? Who would like to take this one? Do you want to repeat the question, sir? Yeah, it's, yeah. the question is around, so if we're, if we're replicating, you know, previous and, and current unwanted practices in the profession, how do we move away from this? How do we how do we push ourselves a little bit further? I think we've got to be innovative, imaginative, and take risks as academics. And we need to take those risks with our students. We need to involve them in that curriculum design process, tell them what we're trying to do, involve them what we're trying to achieve and getting their feedback. If we think we know how we're going to do it, we're probably going to get it wrong. 
if we wait to see what happens further down the track, well, then that takes too long. So we need these more iterative feedback cycles in our teaching and learning, which a lot of is inhibited in a lot of places. I think the other thing we should be doing, and and when I just started working with some people doing, is talking to graduates. I often think, you know, we get accreditation boards come and say, "Have you achieved this, this, and this, and this?" And I always, and they look for these mappings to make sure that they got the opportunity to learn this atomized little bit in all these courses. I think it's more about getting to the end. We should be talking to our graduates and assessing them and say, do they have these skills? You know, do they have these capacities or abilities and that has enabled them to function in the workforce? Mm -hmm. But so looking more forward, I think, is what I'm suggesting. There's no one answer. And we're only going to discover and build that knowledge by taking those risks. I think another thing we can do is make sure that we get a feedback loop in for students that are engaging with professions, whether it's in the workplace or through projects or whichever way. But they see differences between theory and practice, which they're quite uncomfortable with. But they hold a lot of value in unpacking and teasing those out. Um, and I think giving them opportunity to discuss them in a discipline context, like a discipline unit would be useful because that would then feed forward into how we should be designing our learning activities and our assessment to perhaps not, you know, interrogate those differences even further um, with industry partners involved. So I think it provides an opportunity um, for us as well. We might go to the question in the room then. Uh, oh, good. It's working. <laughs> um, and Keith may have I answered the question, but I guess I'm just noting that um, within higher education, often changing the handbook, you know, the handbook is the contract with the student, that's where assessment is set, that has to be done often six, 12 months in advance, it's difficult to change, I guess, just thinking about like, where does that fit in and those logistics around how do we negotiate that if we're talking about things like um you know, negotiated assessment and creating more space, as David's mentioned, um, you know, how do we kind of negotiate that tension around um, the handbook and, and that contract with students versus, I guess, that dialogue with students in maybe um, defining the assessment? Just one point on that. I think you can ask students in whether it's in all different scenarios to identify their own learning goals what they want to get back from the from the um from the assessment or from the learning activity and going to david's point about um people come to university for different reasons they have different career and lifelong learning goals so embedding that career development learning in what you're doing so you might have an assessment task might be for example, or an activity might be to do a forage, you know, job simulation or virtual work experience activity, but the richness might then be in the reflection afterwards, but what they took from it and what means for them as a, as a developing professional. And I think in having that flexibility, and it might be that they do that visually or um, verbally or in a written format is quite important. So you can you can keep that flexibility we with our students going into a placement as i said they they design their own learning plan and that guides them all through their placement knowing that things happen in the workplace and it changes it's a bit iterative and then they look back on and review their performance and their experiences and it's completely different for every student and it's actually you know, marking can be a bit cumbersome sometimes, but it's a joy to mark those because every single one of them is different. And that all falls under an assessment that doesn't change in the in the handbook. So it, it can work. I think the other thing to be, if you want to look at it at a, a practical level, if you're a junior academic, get a supporter who's a senior academic. All right. If you're a lecturer, an associate lecturer, and you're trying to push change through like that, unless you've got a really understanding head of school or something like that, it's going to be difficult. So find yourself somebody. If you're a senior academic, make your case and get on with it. You know what I mean? And actually do those things. But I think we need, it's about engaging students and explaining to them, you know, why we're doing this, why we're going to change this now, what's happening, you know, giving them a choice. So I, I've done this myself several times and I've always asked students, if you want to do it the old way, you can continue. If you want to do it the new way. I've never had anyone pick the old way yet because hopefully the new way is better, but I've had to give them that choice. And that way you've got some cover, if you want to call it, to say you haven't actually gone against the whole agreement and what they signed up to learn. Yeah, just a quick addition to that. Um, we have to be much more creative and innovative in the way we write 
our assessment requirements, um, sometimes we paint ourselves into a corner and sometimes we have very bad practice within the program team in which they um, suppress innovation on the part of their colleagues. So I think we've got to be more creative in the sense of it being clear enough to students about what the expectation is, but not so unbelievably behaviorally tied down that there's no room for manoeuvre. And I think in most cases, there is a kind of a pathway to be trod between those two extremes. Mm-hmm. We're going to go over to Rola. Yeah, I wanted to be a bit provocative and ask if you were going to reflect on, um, say, courses or disciplines that weren't so tightly coupled with vocation and also move us out of the will space and into curricula in university. Do you think authenticity in assessment still holds value? And if so, how? Thanks, Rola. Look, I'm going to start with this, but let me just, I mean, who was it? The scholar who said, we need to stop saying the word curriculum. It just does damage. No one knows knows what it means. But I do think if we think about curriculum as sending signals to students beyond the profession or the degrees, this is actually about the knowledge that counts then there's actually a lot of work to do again around what is the knowledge that counts? How is that knowledge constructed and understood and challenged? And then how through assessment can you show your understanding of that knowledge, but also other knowledges you can bring? So I'm going to link here curriculum to a notion of how we make decisions implicitly and explicitly about what counts as knowledge in an institution. And the role of assessment in that is through pedagogy. How do we help students make that relationship with that knowledge and assessment as a space for them to then sense make that knowledge. That's the way that I would think about that kind of curriculum pedagogy um, relationship, which might not get to it, but we haven't actually talked about knowledge yet. And I do think there's something a lot to say about the role that assessment and authentic assessment plays in knowledges and the impact that can have on differently positioned students in a classroom with some of the messages that we send about the knowledges that count. One of the things about those non-vocational courses and the loosely coupled ones um, is that all those graduates are going to go out and practice something. It just happens that we don't know what their practice is going to be right now. So a lot of the things I was saying about um, the nature of the ways people operate in work still apply to everyone in every non-vocational course. So one of the challenges we've got in our assessment is to design it our assessment activities for those kind of programs in the light of the fact that they are going to practice something. So what does it look like? So emphasis on cooperation and collaboration, emphasis on identifying impact and adjusting to context, things of that kind, which hitherto some of those courses have just left out the equation altogether. So we don't actually have to make the courses dirtily vocational, which is what a lot of people are worried about in order to recognize that our graduates are going to act in the world no matter what they graduate with. Thanks. We have an online... Oh, I was just going to say that a lot of the jobs where our first year students get right now, even if you're in a professional like Michael Engineering, they may not exist yet. Yeah. So it's part of ongoing work anyway. And it's, it could be argued it's the largest part that you need through your career, even if you do have a specific vocation. So that makes it important to include it. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of what the discussion so far has been around is stretching this idea of assessment and thinking of innovative ways, co-designing with students and industry and so on. And one of the questions in the Q&A has prompted a reflection of mine. So the the question was, or a comment, I suppose, from Leanne Shabadi was saying she's heard the word failure a few times today. And to play devil's advocate, how can we move away from this word? But I think in the context of the conversation we're having today, How can we integrate failure or a different word into authentic assessment, given that I'm sure so many of us fail in our day to day work sometimes. So surely that is an authentic part of our jobs and our professional lives. How does that happen in higher education? Failure is just feedback. It's not failure. See, I mean, it depends what you mean by the word. It's not catastrophic failure. You know, you're not going to die. So I mean, it's actually just feedback. So it's how you interpret that. You know, if it doesn't work out the way you expect, if you don't get the outcomes that you set out to do, in a sense, you might say that activity failed. But it's nothing more than that. I I don't mind if you want to change the word, but I think we need to normalise it and say, hang on, this is just feedback. This is part of learning. This is part of you developing. 
Yeah, and I think it's also about recognising your weaknesses, which might not be feedback from others, but that might be through your self-assessment as well. So considering what you need to improve in and how you can improve that is also an important part of learning as well, which you know I think is will develop, well, that will help your own development, but it's also yeah down to resilience as well uh, with the with the failure aspect. And that's critical. Uh, we know resilience um, and being able to pick yourself up and carry on. We know we need that through recruitment processes and well, general survival at work. I think we all draw on resilience. We have to. Um, I think it's the same in every industry. I think to add that one of the competencies that makes professionals very successful is being able to do something when they don't know how to do it. In other words, you get given a task and you get it done. How do you do that? Right, And a lot of that is learnt, well, I hate using the term, you may be self-conscious about saying failure, but that's what develops that resilience and facing that and learning from that. Absolutely. I think we have a question in the room. One of the questions that your discussion has prompted is we've talked about students and we've talked about partnering with industry, but so often, particularly dis business disciplines is my home base, it's the course teams who, are, who lack the competencies to put this into practice, they have very minute PhDs in small areas. They've never learnt the pedagogy that you're talking about today, many of them. They may have worked for 15 years. How do we bring them into this journey to improve their competencies and not resist what is really smart practice? Um, it's not rocket science to give students power, but so many will resist it. So it's that resistance to change. I'm interested in your perspectives. I think supporting them is really important and giving them, it's all, you know, support, is, but actually giving them practical support and ways that they can do that. And I think if you encounter resistance like that, it's often because of fear, they don't know how to do it because that's not their, like you said, that's not their area of expertise. And also they've got a big workload and they can't deal with that at the moment because they've got hundred other things to do. So I think giving them practical support, you know, your learning and teaching advisors that are pros in this area um, on how they might be able to just flip certain assessments or activities so that they are more authentic and bringing in their industry experience because they're experts and students want to, they want those analogies and they want all that um, industry expertise. And just with some key tips and practical advice on how that can be done, I think might lower resistance. And I, I think also not making a mountain out of it. You know, we get, oh, okay, we've all got to do this and we've all got to embed that. And it's sometimes it's just too much. There's too many things going on. So trying to pair it back and just simplify it and give practical support is important. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a bit hard line on this. I think I don't think we should be appointing people that are so rigid and inflexible. You know? <laughs> why, why are we taking them in just because they've got a PhD and they've got a publication record? This is not good enough. You know, if we're in the business of you know training students for the world that, to come, then we need people that are flexible and competent enough to pick up these ideas. And it also means when they come here, it's not a matter of sending them on you know more teacher and learning courses. We need scaffolding within the workplace, within the discipline, within the department, working with people that do have these capabilities to show them there are different ways of doing things. So 45 minutes into the panel and programmatic assessment has come up. Um, so good job, good job. So I guess the question um, I suppose is to ask the panelists about the barriers in designing an assessment across the degree program, maybe thinking about, you know, purposefully keeping it authentic. Um, so those ideas I heard earlier around how we work with people over a long period of time, could that be an aspect of programmatic assessment? How could we do that? What other things need to be considered? This is the big challenge. Mm -hmm. What we've had till now is a de facto everyday practice that we kind of collectively design a new program. You know, and it gets accredited and gets approved and everything. And then we just divvy up all the bits of it, all the different units, different people, and we just let them go off in their own sweet way, doing their own thing, and so on and so forth. Now, I think there is a kind of a route to address this through assessment. And, and that is, um, and it's what some people are doing in some other universities, and that is, why uh, do we have an assessment activity per unit? Why can't we have assessment activities across units? 
And why can't we think about assessment activities that are focused more on the program learning outcomes than the unit outcomes? When we start to look at assessment in that broader light, then it forces us to be, I'm not sure whether authentic is the word, but we have to cross the silos. So a lot of the problem that we have at the moment is the, the siloing of assessment into individual academics, own kind of pet things. And when they've got to cooperate with someone else, when they've got to design assessment activities with someone else, and when they've got to do it in the context of meeting program learning outcomes, then you're changing the frame and new possibilities can emerge. I think um, taking course-wide assessment will open up lots of productive conversations about making sure that everything's scaffolded, you know, um, so industry engagement, career development learning, as well as the discipline knowledge, which I think is a really good thing. Um, it fits beautifully with Will. Will should be scaffolded through the course and, um, yeah, programmatic assessment will work wonderfully with that. So that's that's a very positive thing. I think about business, I think about our Bachelor of Commerce and having 13 majors, and I think it's going to be interesting, having coursework assessment. But I think if you chunk it into minors, for example, or little chunks of units, then and you take that kind of approach, I think that could work quite well. Um, whereas if you take like a nursing degree or teacher education, where perhaps it's more prescribed and structured, I think it will be easier. But, and we were speaking about this earlier, Dave, and I, I think about micro-credentials, which is more around little bits all stacking together. And then I think, how's that gonna work with programmatic assessment? But that's another separate conversation. <laughs> Just want to add one thing that we have been talking about authentic assessment as a good thing. Um, and I think the question was, you know, how do we make the programmatic and the authentic work together? But perhaps we could think about a spectrum of authenticity and how that works across that program of assessment. So rather than everything having to be authentic in every unit and every assessment has to be authentic. What well, can we also, and, and I mean, this is part of the argument for why we have programmatic assessment is also so that we might assess particular learning outcomes across the course rather than just at one point in time. So can we think about authenticity in that way too and think about the, the perhaps the, the themes or streams or layers of authenticity across that program from first year through to final year rather than thinking about it at, every single instance all the time. So taking the zoomed out approach. We're gonna take the last question from the room and then I'm gonna end on uh, some final reflections from the panelists. Thank you to the panel for your time and generosity and sharing your knowledge. I guess this question is building off of Chad's question earlier and some of the reflections that Dave had because we're in a time of potentially decoupling from capitalism and I'm really curious about, you know, work. What is work? Um, and I guess I just want to hear from each of the panel members, starting with Joe, perhaps because you've got the mic. And um, what are the values that matter to you? Just quickly from everybody, like just, yeah, what are the values that matter to you in assessment and in life? And, you know, what are, what are the means that were, sorry if that's a bit philosophical, but... <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, happy happy to tackle that one. Um, um, if I take a very cradle line, a thing that matters probably across work and everything else is knowing if you've done a good job of a thing, a valid of judgment. So I, I think this is something that carries through um, whether you're in a professional course or a discipline or non-vocational, whatever it is, it's knowing you've done a good job of the things that that are appropriate for, for whatever it is that you're learning. It could be something that you're learning outside of university as well. So I think knowing that how, and knowing how to learn that you've done a good job for, and distinguishing a gift between not so good and, and how you can improve is, is part of that. So a valid judgment. Um, key focus for me is transformation, but for all. So transformation for all students, that's a key focus for me in my work. Yeah, yeah thanks, Amina, for the question. Um, broadly speaking, what matters to me in education is that we don't do things that dehumanize, that there's a recognition. And assessment 
is the spot where you get it right or you get it wrong in terms of how learners feel about themselves and understand their relationship to learning and, and to other people in that. And I will leave it at that. Uh, I'm not sure necessarily that uh, personal things that you want to get out of work and what your employer wants from you actually coexist or are the same. Maybe if they are the same, that's why you're more happy in what you're doing and maybe that's part of the indication. But, um, I mean, from my professional point of view in work, my job is probably to prepare students to be engineers. You know, not to make them engineers, prepare them. Myself, personally, I've got to have a space where I can be innovative, creative, and, um, you know, have some sort of impact. If it hasn't got impact that's going to last beyond what I'm doing, then I'm not really interested. And luckily, I've got a space at the moment where I can do that. So... Mm -hmm. Um, I'm tempted to say all of the above, um, uh, but, but I, I think if, if you're focusing on one in particular, it's about learning. My value is that when we're dealing with students, we should leave them much, much better equipped to learn things that we don't know about, that we don't even envisage than they can right now. All right. Well, to, to wrap up, we are going to do final reflections. Um, panelists, to guide your final reflections a little bit, I, I want you to imagine in the audience, you have a, uh, a captive audience of people who just absolutely love authentic assessment. They see nothing wrong with it. They think it's a great term. Why wouldn't we do it all of the time? What is something that you could say, maybe a question or a statement that would problematize or trouble the idea of authentic assessment? Authenticity is in the eye of the beholder. So whose authenticity are you privileging? Authenticity has challenges um, and might not always be possible. I would say that's great. What is it that you love about authentic assessment? Who is it working for? Why is it that you have decided that this is an unquestionable, desirable, good thing? So I would use it as a conversation starter to understand more. Um, I don't think anything all the time is good for anybody. I think we actually have lots of different things and bad experiences are actually good experiences and because we're going to encounter them in everything that we do. So I would in, don't think it has to be or everything has to be authentic per se. I think it has its place. Uh, I think I'd say um, don't pretend that authentic means one thing, mm -hmm. that there is a diversity of meaning and We've started to kind of be talking about that throughout the day today and a bit on the panel here. So we need to unpack the different dimensions of it, the different readings of it, the different meanings of it from the different parties involved. And there's a lot of negotiation. There's a lot of what you might call horse dealing required within staff groups, between staff and students, and with other external parties to actually make meaning out of what we mean by authentic. So Dave, are you suggesting that authentic assessment is not going to save assessment in higher education? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's the perfect way to wrap up. I will just quickly plug the open panel session for tomorrow, another all-star uh, panel discussion of what is the role of digital in authentic of, of the authenticity of assessment. And I have no doubt that AI will come up at that point. It did not come up today. But let's all thank our wonderful panelists for a great discussion.